I'm really glad to be here. I'm sure you all agree with me that the census of India is the largest census in the world. But that's not just because we count 1.21 billion people, but also because we count them with 2.7 billion functional units, which is probably larger than the population of a lot of countries in the world. Plus, we have two full rounds. The first round is house listing, the second round is the population enumeration. Two full rounds in which enumerators go house to house all over the country. And the entire data collected in these two rounds is fully processed. 100% of the questions, 100% of the questions are processed to give you the census results. It's not just the plain size, it's also the complexity of the work that we do. We have 35 questions in the house listing. There are 29 questions in the population enumeration. And because the country is so large, the schedules have to be printed, filled, and processed in as many as 16 languages. And the training manuals are made in as many as 18 languages. So how do we go around doing this? How come we are able to give you the original population very three weeks after completing the census? Of course, we have a long history. We've been learning over time. So the first time we did the census was in 1872. But there's something more to how we do it. It's the basic principles on which we do the entire work that make sure that we give you good data, clean and reliable data. The most important thing that we have is, of course, the fact that we have a Census Act. The Census Act 1948 and the Census Rules give us the legal backing we need to make sure that the census is really complete. Because by law, every person living in the country has to answer all the questions in the census. But it's just not that we are forcing you to answer the questions. It's also that because it's a mandatory thing, statutory thing, we have to ask you the questions, you have to give us the answers. So what happens in that is that the data that comes in is neutral. It's not colored by any imagined benefit. Because if you do a survey asking people if they have X item in their house, and people believe that if they say, no, we don't have it, the government is going to give it to them, then you can imagine that the data isn't going to be very clean. The census is just something that is, it's legal, you just have to do it. So nobody is going to give you wrong answers if they don't have a motivation to do so. That is the most important advantage of having a legal pattern. So while we force you, so-called, we mandatorily ask you questions and ask you to give us the answers, at the same time we give you a complete guarantee of protection of your privacy. Because in the act, all the answers given in the census are confidential. What does this actually mean? It means that no individual's data is ever given out by us. It's not given out to the public. It's not given to anybody who asks us. And it's not even given if a court of law asks us. So that data is completely safe with us. And any data we do give out is anonymized. We remove all the names. We make sure that the granularity of the data that we give out is of such a scale that through geographical details or through any other personal details, there is no way you can make out an individual person's data. In a census, it's understood. Everyone has to be counted. What we say is that everyone has to be counted without omission and without duplication. But it isn't as easy as it, as it looks because uh, there are always some people, some groups, which are more difficult to count than others very remote settlements, remote islands in the Andamans, remote villages in Arunachal Pradesh, and may not be very remote. There may be people living right in front of you. There may be a servant living in a house. The enumerator goes to the house, the servant gives the enumerator water, but the enumerator forgets to ask whether this person lives in the house or not. So there are many reasons why people are vulnerable and why they are difficult to count. So for us, the first priority is to ensure that all the vulnerable groups, we are aware of who they are, and we know how to bring them to the center of our consciousness when we are doing the entire planning and preparation for the census. And it's greatly helped when we do this because we have a very open way of preparing for the census. There's nothing secretive about the way we do it. About three or four years before the census uh, starts, we start asking data users, we start asking demographers, planners, what are the questions they want us to ask? What is the kind of data they want us to give them? Without that, we don't finalize the questions. And secondly, in the entire training process of the enumerators, the publicity we do to reach out to the respondents, and the field monitoring we do to make sure that the work is going on properly, we always involve the sector of NGOs, NGOs 
dealing with the houseless people, NGOs dealing with gender, NGOs dealing with uh, persons with disability, they're all part of our census process. And there are the UN agencies, because the UN agencies prescribe the standards of the census for the entire world, and they always work very closely with us. It's not enough to just go and ask the question and get the data, because there are always biases that you and I may not even be aware of, and we hold them. These are the biases that society just carries, and we have to be very careful that the innovator shouldn't have these biases, and the respondent, if they have the biases, the innovator should know how to overcome them. So the innovator is trained specifically to ask each and every question for each and every person living in that house. So suppose the head of the household is a Hindu. It is not to be assumed that all the members of the family are Hindu. You can't just write Hindu and Hindu, 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 Hindu. You have to ask for each person. That's part of the training. And similarly, for the respondent, you have to ask in such a way to overcome any bias that person seems to be showing. The time for which the census work goes on is very limited. It's three weeks for the field work and then five days for the uh, revision round after the census time. So if we find out that we have messed up a month later, there's no way we can go back and set right what's gone wrong. So we must have perfect and continuous feedback loops. For the innovators, we have a whole system of supervisors and their uh, superior officers who are always in touch so that if the innovator has a problem in the field, the problem is solved immediately. And if the innovator has a problem with skills, if uh, he or she is confused about some question being asked, if she doesn't know how to fill a form, then she has access to the person who trained her, the master trainer. So she can talk to that person right there on the spot, on the phone, and know how to fill the form. Similarly, we need feedback from the public because any area is left out, any person is left out, if there are rumors floating around, or if real mischief is happening somewhere, we must know about it as soon as possible. And for that, we have a very, uh, very broad-based system of feedback. We had the toll-free number this time, which was highly publicized, and we got a lot of response on it. We have help desks in the Tehsil offices in the rural areas. And this year, especially, email, Facebook, and Twitter were a fantastic source of information and feedback because of which we could get better data than ever. So now I'd like to talk a bit about the processes we follow. The first step <laughs> when we have to count everybody is to make sure we know where they live. And that means we have to know where every house is, not only physically where it is, but also which administrative unit it falls in, because that's how we have to count the data. And for this, we first update all our maps. So we have with us shape files of all the villages in the country, and all the administrative maps built are built in aggregate to these shape files. Also, this time in 33 capital cities, we had a special project of building level satellite based GIS mapping. The maps were taken, the surveys of all the roads were done, all the building numbers were applied, and on that basis the enumeration blocks were cut in these urban areas. Apart from that, we have this very old-fashioned but extremely useful method of mapping. This is an A3 sheet given to each and every enumerator, and the enumerator, while doing the field work, makes a hand-drawn map of the area, showing the landmarks and showing each and every structure. And this turned out to be extraordinarily useful uh, in Uttarakhand because in the last two, three weeks, the disaster management authorities have been asking us for the maps of the villages which were swept away to see what were the structures that were actually existing earlier. And this has uh, been very helpful to them. On the basis of these uh, geographical administrative units, the latest maps, the enumeration blocks we cut, we create this code, and this code is the key for the entire system of maintaining the data. This is an hierarchical code which leads to right down to the household. Starts from the state, district, sub-district, town or village, ward in the case of the town, the innovation block, and the household. So each and every household in the entire country has a unique code. This is how we ensure that data doesn't go all right from one place to another. Regarding the questionnaire, there are two aspects to the questionnaire. One is the design of the question itself. How are you going to phrase the question? What is the answer you, what is the kind of data you want from the answer? And the other side is how do you design the schedule itself, the enumerator is going to fill. Regarding the questions, the most important thing is that because we have
have a whole string of censuses uh, behind us, and the data has to be comparable to the old censuses. Even if we ask a new question, as far as possible, if the same data is being taken both times, the question should at least be compatible. But even if you're asking something extra this time, we shouldn't be losing out on the data which has already been collected earlier. The questions should be in a sequence which is logical. The least personal questions come first, and the most personal questions come at the end. That is why in the, center, in the population enumeration questionnaire, the fertility questions come right at the end. And the phrasing of the question is very important because it has to be gender and class neutral. For example, if you go into rural North India and ask, Ki aapke kitne hai? there's a good chance the man who's responding is going to say, Mere teen ladke. The person may just forget that ladkiya are also bachche, because that's the way the language is in, that, in those parts when you say bachche, you normally think only of the boys. So the enumerator has to ask the question, aapke kitne bete hai, kitne betiya? That's how we ensure that you get the right answer. This is an example of how we design the question. In the last census, we got several thousand different responses to the question on religion. There are all kinds of denominations, all kinds of strange names, the names of their gurus, sometimes their own surnames, all sorts of responses came to religion. Nevertheless, 98% of the data fell into one of the six major religions in So our data processing guys are happiest when they only have to look at four. So they just you have male, female, other, and gender, one, two, three, so you just add it up and there's the result. So the more codes you have, the happier they are. And the more codes you have, the more unhappy our social studies guys are, because then you're losing out on all the complexity within that particular uh, <coughs> subject. So this was the compromise we came at. The enumerator is asked to write the name of the religion in full in long hand. And if the religion is one of these six major religions, also to write a quote. If it is not one of these six, then the quote column is left blank and only the name of the religion is given. And how the two, the quotes and the longhand things, how they are processed, I'll explain in a bit. The schedule itself, the design of the questionnaire is very important. The most important thing is that it should be clear and simple, even though we are asking 29 questions. The enumerator is after all likely to be on the level of a primary school teacher. The enumerator has to fill it up. And the respondent as far as possible should be able to read it and understand it without much difficulty. So it has to be designed to be easy to read, easy to write, simple and clear. It has to be of very good quality because it has to go to every part of the country, be filled in for three weeks, it will go around in the heat and dust, then it will come back all the way, then it will go into the scanning. So it has to be of good quality. After that it's even stored for ten years before it's destroyed uh, before the next census. And then the design has to be right for scanning and intelligent character recognition, which is the way we do our processing. So this is what a schedule look like. And there are a lot of design tweaks here which are very interesting. The first thing is that we use a color dropout, because in 2001, we had done the scanning, which we done it with the usual black and white uh, form with the black boxes. And the lines in the boxes interfered with the marks made by the enumerator. So this time we had a color dropout, the entire thing will go off and only the marks made by the enumerator will be visible in the final scan. The unique location code I talked about is right there at the top so that it's, uh, it's uh, very easy to stack the forms uh, properly. Uh, the forms will get displaced. Side A and side B is written as clearly as possible. And there's a little cut at the upper corner, just like in a SIM card, so that when you stack the forms, and you just look at them, you can see if you stack any of them upside down. So that was very useful in packing and also later on at the scanning stage. Incidentally, this design has evolved to help the National Institute of Design and frankly, I think, I think it is a great job to form. The intelligent character recognition that our software does is only of the numerical characters and this is how the numerical characters are to be written by, by the enumerator. This is, uh, in fact, put right on top in the form so that the enumerator remembers it. For example, the one should not have a peak, otherwise the software will not, will not recognize it correctly. So the first step in the processing, after all the forms have come back, is making sure that they're stacked correctly in the right areas and not upside down for the scanning. The scanning is done with high-speed uh, duplex uh, 
A3 scanners. The paper was exactly A3 in size, 1986. And there's a barcode based control system for making sure that all the scanning happens correctly. <coughs> this is what the color dropout uh, form looks like after the uh, scanning is done. And before the uh, actual character recognition takes place, each of those images, directed images, have to be matched to template so that the right data is going to the right <coughs> column in the ICR. And this is how the ICR is done. If it's a long number, it is first separated into individual digits. After that, each digit goes into the software. The name of the software is eFlow. It's an Israeli software we use. We use it in large instances also. Each and every character goes into the recognition. And after that, all the characters in that batch recognize as a one. They're put into this kind of uh, tile screens. And our data entry operators who are highly trained to do this work, they sit and look at these screens one after the other. So this entire thing has already been uh, processed by the software, but it's again looked at by the operator. So everything which is anomalous like this, which apparently uh, isn't a one, this is picked up by the operator and sent off for the exception. So all the ones, all the twos, in fact, the entire data goes in front of the operator also. It's not done only by the computer. After all the exceptions are clear, the error rate is less than 1%. And now when it comes to the other kind of processing we do, because everything, like I said, cannot be coded, this is the way we do when we have a long hand answer. In the last census, like I said, we had thousands of religions. All those religions which were found last time they were given particular quotes. So that library is already available of the previous quotes. And when you have a new, uh, when you have uh, the operators looking at a longhand uh, reply, the drop down menu is available. A few digits are typed in. And the, uh, from the menu, you can select if any of them is fitting what is there in the screen. If it fits, then the particular quote already available is applied to that response. Sometimes it's possible that it's a totally new thing which nobody has ever heard of and it's not even in the library. In that case, the operator gives it a new quote and all such new quotes go back to the field offices to be verified if, in fact, the operator may not have uh, full knowledge. Maybe the senior people know better or the field people know better. So all of it goes back to them to find out if really there is something like that or if there is a field or if it is some kind of mistake. And after that kind of data cleaning, this computer assisted coding is completed. So when I say that religion data, mother tongue data is going to uh, take a lot of time, so please don't think that I'm you know, trying to make excuses. This takes a lot of time. And the most difficult of all of these longhand answers is the classification of the workers. So the NIC NCO classification is like something like 60 categories, and it's very difficult to know. For example, if you have a journalist. Somebody writes journalist, somebody writes media, somebody writes press, somebody writes reporter. And so the operator has to work out that all of them fall into the same category. So this coding is really hard. That's why our data, uh, data division people always like to avoid this. After that is done comes the time of cleaning the process data. The software used is IMPS, which is DOS-based, or CS Pro, which is windows based It's a software from the US <coughs> It's free to use, but it's not open source. And these are checks we have to make. The first is coverage checks to make sure that the wrong data is not going to the wrong enumeration block. No area is left over, or no area has been counted twice. It's a very tedious job. It has to be done, it's to be done through the code. It's also to be done manually. Then come the consistency checks, which are, again, a very lengthy exercise, because there are all kinds of edit rules we have to apply. And these edit rules have to be evolved out of experience and logic. <coughs> For example, if somebody is coding in as illiterate, then definitely in the education uh, level you cannot have an SC. So all these things have to be written down. That, uh, before this particular age, there is no likelihood of having children. If this person is a male, this person cannot have something written in the fertility column. Similarly, all these edit rules have been developed. There are hundreds of them, and new ones have to be developed all the time. On that basis, the consistency checks are done. Then comes the issue of imputation. The one thing we don't do is item imputation. If a person has not been returned in the form, if an area has not been covered by the enumerator, we just leave it alone. 
and he declared that that area has not been covered, or that village has not been covered, or there is no more persons in that area. For example, in 1981, we could not do Assam, Assam was disturbed. In 1991, we could not do Kashmir. In 2001, some sub-districts of Manipur gave such bad results that we just had to abandon them. And I'm very happy to report that it is in this census, after all these years, that we have covered every single inch of the country. There are only a very few villages in some Naxal districts that have been left out. So we do not do unit imputation. On the other hand, we do have to resort to item imputation often. Because uh, suppose gender is missing in a particular column. Then there are three or four ways in which we can decide what gender to put in there. One is that maybe there are some redundant columns, for example, gender is repeated in the literacy column. So maybe he filled it up in the literacy column, we can pick it up from there. Or we can make a guess from the fertility column. If it's not available at all, then there are two ways of doing item imputation. One is called hot deck, one is called cold deck. In cold deck, what you do is that you look at the previous data. You can look at the data of the previous census, or you could look at the data of the batch which has just been completed. And on that basis, you do the imputation. So if an area clearly has 70% literacy, then all the missing entries can be uh, imputed at a rate of 70 to 30. Or we could do hot deck imputation, which is picking up a value from within the matrix of the same batch. <coughs> After that work is done, which is the longest and most tedious work, I can tell you, the editing part, then comes the tabulation. The tabulation plans are always published in advance for the census, which are the tables that we are going to release. Because it is on the basis of the tabulation plan that the questions are designed. So in the Indian census, every single question has its own univariate table. And those tables are always TMN, that's total male, female. And wherever applicable, they are also TRU, total rural urban. Apart from all the univariate tables, we also have some multivariate tables, age, literacy, or uh, education level, to sex, and so on. Apart from that, we always uh, we are always ready to develop customized tables on request of data users. And also, we recast the data of the previous censuses on the basis of the administrative boundaries of the new census, so that both the data are comparable. These are the final tables that we publish. The house listing tables, there are two series, the first is for house, FH for household. The population enumeration, these are the series. A is population, the numbers. B is workers, C is social and cultural tables, D is about migration, F about fertility, and the SC and ST series. Apart from that, we have some beautiful addresses, thematic as well as administrative. I think a lot of you uh, would like to know exactly what is our data dissemination policy. So, yeah, about the copyright. You are free to use our data as long as you give us acknowledgement. On the other hand, please don't try to resale or redistribute our data unless you are doing some value addition to it. So that's our uh, data use policy. I'm sure most of you have seen our website. If you have not, please, please do see it. There's lots and lots of things on it. And there's another product that I'd like to talk about called Census Info, which is developed by Kevin Fo, an organization which works with the UNICEF. And what they've done is they've created a software which can freely download and which contains uh, also the data sets themselves, all the data that has been released till now, plus all the shape files. And on this basis, you can develop your own tables, your own graphs, and your own maps. You can even move your maps and superimpose your own Google So this is just fantastic. Please do look at it. If you want more hazardous data than is available on the website, please do contact our director. There's one in every state capital. Plus, we're doing something different this time. In uh, around 15 universities across the country, we're going to set up workstations this year, in which the entire data sets are available. Plus, microdata at an anonymized level is also available, where you can uh, make your own tables and so on. There are two which are already set up. One is at JNU, and one is at Punjabi University, Patiala. And I'm sure there'll be one set up in uh, Karnataka. These are our print publications. The new ones are already all available online, so maybe they're not that interesting. But I think the very old ones are very interesting because we have these books from 1872 onwards. And 
and now we are creating the digital archive of these books on microfilm and these should be available online too within a few months. <coughs> these are the three data releases that have already happened in provisional population totals, the housing and the primary census abstract. And soon we'll be coming out one by one with age grouping, disability, religion, migration, mother tongue, workers, and baby more. I had a question on the funnel. Uh, I had a comment asking me to talk about the utility of census data. And well, everybody knows this. The elections are held on the basis of the constituencies, and the constituencies are on the basis of the census data. The delimitation takes place on the basis of the census enumeration blocks, and the reservation of the seats also depends on the census. So this is really important. Then all other surveys, almost all other surveys, base their uh, sampling frames on the census enumeration blocks. And that's why I think we'll be expecting new uh, sampling frames very soon. The Planning Commission, of course, depends entirely on our data for projection, to report requirements, to check whether the goals have been achieved or not. And there are three small examples, specific examples of impact of census data that I'd like to talk about. There is this map here. This is showing the child sex ratio in Punjab 1991 and 2001. As you can see, 1991 it was middling, it wasn't very bad, it was in the late 80s, 70s. I mean, it was bad but not horrible. In 2001, it was less than 800 in all the districts. So it was really bad, and I think the government also had no idea that it had gone so bad. If they hadn't done the census, they wouldn't have come to know. But on the basis of that, they did a lot of micro planning, they worked very hard. They, uh, uh, took, uh, took pains to work against the ultrasound and so on, and they managed to improve the child sex ratio from 798 to 846 in 10 years. Manual scavenging is something that most government agencies would rather say that no, it doesn't exist in our area. But when in the census data, small but definite numbers of manual scavenging did come out, the government has made a special policy to ensure that manual scavenging is totally rooted out. And one more example I'd talk, like to talk about is the electrification of villages. In the 91 census, a lot of villages were shown as electrified. In the, when the data was seen, only one house in those villages was electrified. And then it was decided that if only one house has electricity, then how can this village be considered electrified? And the definition of electrification was changed to ensure that at least 10 houses are going to have electricity, only then the village is considered electrified. So this is how census data helps at a very large scale and it also can help in a very small scale to take decisions.
So yeah, my question was, uh, are there any checks and balances to make sure that the data inside the census organization is also sort of uh, uh, anonymized? Because 2.7 million is a huge number, as you mentioned. Yes, uh, the 2.7 functionaries are not, uh, I mean, I wish they are not out of reach. Why do we need census? Hi, 
um, two questions actually. Uh, one around, are there any, uh, is there any connection with Aadhaar uh, in this sort of thing? That's what the required other slots I have. Two, uh, are there any corporate users for this? I mean, because I can see a lot of people would want for that sort of data. What's the policy for that? I mean, we don't have a separate policy for corporate users. I mean, there is a certain granularity till which we are willing to give you data in any form you want it. Anybody who asks for it is going to get it. That's, that's not an issue at all. And uh, regarding our connection with Aadhaar, then I'll try to say it very briefly. We have this project called the Popula National Population Register. That's not under the Census Act, because as the Census Act, everything is 100% confidential. That's under the Citizenship Act. But we base it on the same unique location code. And uh, what you saw, that code, it went up to the household. In the case of the National Population Register, that code goes down to every member of the household. So everybody is tagged, and we know that a particular area has been fully covered, and we have the data of all the people living there. Of course, none of the data is really confidential in nature. It's the kind of thing you'll find in electoral laws or anywhere else. So the privacy issue doesn't come there. The privacy issue does come when we talk about the biometrics we connect with it. So what uh, the National Population Register mandates is that we first collect the database which is already done during the first round of the, of the census, and then we go around collecting the biometrics for all those people. The purpose of the biometrics is simply to deduplicate our own database. And because the UID was already there, this task of deduplication was to be done by them. There was no point in them setting up a whole uh, bin for it separately, we setting it up separately. So this work was given to them. Unfortunately, what happened is that they started doing this field work of biometrics simultaneously, and that has caused a lot of confusion in the field. I mean, since we were already doing it, I mean, they need not have really done it. We were already the agency which was authorized to do it. But be that as it may, right now what we're doing is wherever the Aadhaar has already gone and done a lot of biometrics, what we're doing is we're going back in the field behind them, and then we are picking up the Aadhaar numbers from the people so that the biometric doesn't have to be collected. The National Population Register is a legal entity and it has to be made and it, it is of a degree of perfection which the Aadhaar database can never reach. So, we will find it. Yeah, just a small suggestion on the floor. Uh, I believe that the census I believe that the census uh, uh, collection stuff can be made more uh, technology savvy. Yeah. The, the volunteers who basically go from home to home to collect the, uh, the data, probably those, uh, those people will be provided with some way of uh, technological equipment like a laptop or a tablet, yeah. so that the, the collection of data and the, the collection of data can be uh, done more seamlessly. And this can be done also in conjunction with the, with the, the, U, the UID part and the other tasks, and to make the process more, like, a lot more seamless. And, but the connection to the Aadhaar, I've already explained, I think, it's not, uh, I need to explain further. Here I mentioned the SECC. The SECC is the socio-economic and caste census. Even though the word census is there, and it's the, it wasn't done by us really, and it's not really a census, it's a complete survey based on the uh, census frame. And here tablets were used. In fact, it was we who recommended the tablets be used for it. But only six flat tablets were used, and the SECC has been in fact going on for the last two years. But the census has to be done in a fixed time period. So we have 2.7 million functionaries, we need 2.7 million tablets. That's not cheap. Secondly, 2.7 million functionaries have to be taught how to use them, and we haven't reached that maturity yet. But maybe next time. Next time it's very much possible that it will be done on the tablets. Yeah, hello, ma'am. Uh, it was a very uh, useful talk. Um, I learned things in, about the census. So I have a uh, couple of questions. Uh, I understand that size of would be huge. How much is that data size that we are storing here? Uh, since the census data is about a million people, so it has to be huge data. And so how do we store that data? And uh, is there any plan to use to understand that data, to derive correlations, to, uh, to uh, understand patterns and all, all things. So is there any plan uh, adopting such technology? And you know the data, well, it, it, what we do is that we uh, mainly use the software called CS Pro or IFPS. And 
and then when it comes to Lakhon, the archives are huge in uh, volume, all those scanned forms that you take up a lot of space. And the actual data, it, it's all uh, processed in ASCII. It, it is boils down to not, not all that great. It's a few hundred GB. It's not really big data in that sense. And uh, well, of course we're looking, uh, that's one reason why I was very keen to attend here, yeah, very, very much looking to uh, learn the technology. And then of course, we'd love, more importantly, we'd love to disseminate the data as far as possible so that people like you actually use it and you know, come out with correlations and everything. Thanks. Ma'am, uh, uh, you said you don't make uh, all the data available. You keep the its granularity big enough so that uh, nobody can uh, point out the person. So, is there any set of data that you would like uh, that should be made for, uh, open to people and uh, researchers and so on, so that they can find out uh, uh, good discoveries? But you cannot do that because of some uh, reasons that it can be misused. So is there, is there any set of data that... Uh, Anything, any, any kind of data is prone to misuse. You never know. You never know what people want to do with it. But one regret, certainly I do have a mention to that uh, the shape files are all uh, protected by the Survey of India. So we use them. We can't give them out publicly because there are a lot of restrictions on uh, giving out uh, GIS data to the public. So if you have that, I think you do a lot of things with it, but we can't do it. Questions, please take them off, right?